So please join me in welcoming Michelle Chris, and we'll let Matt, um, Matthew, uh, introduce her this morning. Thanks for being here, Michelle. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Can you guys, you guys hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you again, Michelle, for uh, taking the time out of your day to come speak to us. I know a lot of us were, were pretty excited. Um, so without further ado, I have the honor of introducing Michelle Chris. Michelle is a landscape ecologist for the Bureau of Land Management, more specifically with fire and aviation. Michelle graduated from the University of Georgia with a Bachelor's of Science in Biology and Pre-Vet. She also attended the University of Massachusetts Amherst and received a Master's in Science in Landscape Ecology, as well as spent her time as a research assistant. While working with the BLM, M Michelle focuses her efforts at the National Interagency Fire Center, where she uses applied sciences for land management and conservation. Michelle works with federal and state agencies in developing science-based land management goals and objectives. She also helps with land management policy and planning processes and assesses the impacts of existing or proposed land management on ecological resources and wildlife habitats. Michelle is also a member of the Board of Directors for Central North Flyway Director and past president of the Golden Eagle Audubon Society. Michelle is also a USGS wildlife biologist and contributed a lot of her effort, efforts as a lead author of the USGS Open File Report. One of her main goals as an ecologist is that she focuses on developing landscape scale modeling frameworks and restoration strategies for sagebrush lands, forests, and wildlife habitats. And without further ado, thank you again, Michelle, for joining us today. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Matthew. That was a great introduction. Um, and so, and also just thank you for inviting me here today uh, to be a part of your class. Um, I really appreciate that. And just to start, I want to say a few words um, about John Freeman. Um, you know, I, I met John uh, when I was a research ecologist back in the day, um, actually at the Wilderness Society. And I knew him for about 15 years, and I've always valued like, all the work he has done. Um, he has been very instrumental in, in shaping land management policy. And I can say that I really miss uh, his dry sense of humor and his wit in all things, federal and state land management, as well as just politics in general, and that he had a talent um, for bringing people together um, and really focusing on solutions in our land management dilemmas. And so for today, um, in my talk, um, I'm just going to discuss the scientific perspective in the present challenges of wildfire management. And I'm going to show some preliminary results on emerging wildfire trends in our non forested ecosystems. Uh, that includes sagebrush, deserts, and grasslands, um, all due to the large scale spread of invasive non native grasses. I will touch on how current fire management policies don't address these emerging trends and talk about some potential management and conservation strategies for these ecosystems. So historically, we have had a century of wildfire management, mainly focused on fire suppression on forested lands. And this began in 1910, uh, soon after the US Forest Service was established in 1905. Uh, this national fire policy um, was really a product of the big blow up of 1910, which was a series of forest fires that burned over 5 million acres across Idaho, uh, Montana and Washington. And this event triggered full fire suppression in the 10 a.m. policy um, to protect timber resources in rural communities. And there were public education campaigns that were developed, you know, such as Smoky Bear, that was really focused largely on reducing human caused fires. Um, and then in the 1970s, federal agencies began to recognize the ecological role of fire for forests and began to let fires burn and also use prescribed fire. In the 1990s to present, 
all federal agencies. We're trying to really strike this balance uh, between fire suppression to protect communities and also trying to bring back the ecological role of fire. And this evolved into the development of the National Cohesive Wildland Fire Strategy, which um, was in the early 2000s, up to 2009. And this was a push to work collaboratively among all stakeholders, federal, state, private, and across all landscape ownerships, uh, using best science to make meaningful progress uh, towards three goals, which was the creation of resilient landscapes, fire adapted communities, and safe and effective wildfire response. And throughout this whole time period, all other land management agencies, you know, like the BLM, has always followed the Forest Service's lead on fire policy. So much of our research and our science um, on forest fire has really influenced our national policies concerning wildland and fire management. And this research has emphasized that our current wildfire situation is really a result of a lack of forest fire that was caused by a century of fire suppression. And the Forest Service states, you know, that historically there was an average of somewhere of four to 5.3 million uh, U.S. forest acres that burned annually. And I just wanted to point out here that just in the 2020 wildfire season, um, so far, 8 million acres have burned across all of our land jurisdictions. And we are now seeing an average of approximately 7 million acres burn a year, just from 2000 to 2020. In addition, a lot of our recent seminal legislation and our funding for wildland fire management is heavily invested in forest fuel reductions, community protection, and restoration of fire, you know, which includes prescribed fire and forest thinning. And you know, examples of this legislation include the Healthy Forest Restoration Act in 2003, the Forest and Landscape Restoration Act and the Omnibus Bill in 2009, and also the Farm Bill in 2019 that really just promotes active forest management. And there's currently, there's a national prescribed fire act that's being developed uh, right now. But given all this legislation, um, nationally, acres burned in fire suppression costs have increased roughly five times from 1985 to 2017. And there are other costs associated with these wildfires as well. Uh, state and federal agencies pay the bulk of the federal suppression costs, and these costs only comprise 9% of total wildfire costs. Uh, whereas total annualized costs is approximately from 71 to 348 billion. And this is due to loss of infrastructure, loss of private property, uh, construction costs, emergency evacuations, loss of ecosystem services, and also post-fire recovery efforts, you know, such as large-scale seedings. And so I just want to point out here that most of our area burned under our modern fire regime is really under extreme conditions. So 3% of our fires burn approximately 95% of the area. And this modern fire regime is a result of many factors combined. Uh, the first is a change in climate. Um, you know, much literature has shown that climate has a strong influence on fire regimes. And during drier climate cycles in the past, wildfire was more frequent, whereas during periods of wetter climate cycles, you know, fire was more infrequent. Um, today's kind of warming climate is believed to be creating these longer fire seasons, um, drier conditions, and more extreme fire events and behavior. Um, humans also have a large effect on wildfire. So approximately 88 to 97% of our fires are human caused. And this is a result of recreation, arson, campfires, fireworks, target shooting, power lines, I mean, just a whole host of, of things. And these human activities have also expanded the fire season significantly, where wildfire management activities are now occurring over a fire year uh, rather than a fire season. 
um, like we used to experience. There's also a lack of appropriate zoning uh, for wildfire in the wildland urban, urban interface. And so examples include these high housing densities, um, transmission line routes, um, evacuation routes, and also defensible space around homes. And there's also altered vegetation conditions, um, which is a, a result of fire suppression, but also a result of some types of natural resource management. You know, and some examples can include logging or, or grazing that has altered our fire cycle. And then there's one factor that has recently only started to gain attention. And this factor is the introduction of invasive non-native grasses. Um, that dry out early in the season, in the fire season, and create this dry, continuous field bed that promotes a very fast spread of fire, um, especially under windy conditions. And since I know you all are pretty familiar, or I think you are, uh, with forest fire and these other factors, I'm going to really focus the rest of my lecture on this newer science perspective of invasive non-native grasses that are altering fire regimes uh, where fire is actually burning too much in our non-forested ecosystems across the West. And these non-forested areas are in, include um, sagebrush, um, other shrubland types, our deserts, like the Sonoran Desert, and grassland communities um, that now really are at a risk of permanent loss um, due to this increased fire cycle and invasives. And so the sagebrush ecosystems across the West, and we see them here in Idaho, um, really provide a great example of altered fire regimes in our non-forested system. So this map here on the left um, shows historic fire perimeters that have occurred across the Western US over the past few decades. Uh, the different sagebrush communities are shown in green, and the dark red are fires that have burned in these sagebrush dominated landscapes. The orange are fires that have burned in other vegetation types, um, primarily forested areas, but they also do include some desert ecosystems and chaparral as well. So just over the past 19 years, um, we have lost over 15 million acres of sagebrush lands to uncharacteristic wildfire. And this is primarily occurring in the Great Basin, which are the portions of Nevada, Oregon, and Idaho. And then just from 2014 to 2018, um, approximately 9 million acres of greater safe house habitat has burned, with 80% of that area burning within the Great Basin. Um, and we are seeing large fire sizes of 100,000 to 400,000 acres that are becoming increasingly common. Um, we're also seeing an increase in fire spread and fire behavior. And so just for example, at the very bottom left, um, right here, um, is a, a graphic of a satellite imagery of the Martin Fire from 2018 in Nevada. And let me get rid of this little pop-up. Um, that started by fireworks and burned approximately 450,000 acres in uh, four to five days. And so to really help understand this emerging wildfire trend in the sagebrush systems, I'm just going to provide sort of a brief context of how these trends have changed over time. Um, so historically, uh, fire cycles were really highly variable um, across this sagebrush biome. Um, fire return intervals could range from several decades in our colder, moisture, higher elevations to just hundreds of years in hotter, drier, lower elevations. And this type of fire regime had a very strong influence on sagebrush landscape structure and helped just to create these large, expansive areas that were dominated by dense sagebrush. Our contemporary fire cycles have actually substantially changed from these historic trends. Um, fire cycles and hotter, drier, lower elevations um, are the turn fire intervals are shorter and they don't allow time for full recovery. Um, and this is really due to this interaction with these annual non native invasive grasses. And we are seeing reburns occur on average every seven to 15 years now. 
um, our fire cycles in the colder, moister, higher elevations, however, we've actually seen a shift towards smaller and less frequent fires. And this is due to successful fire suppression efforts. Um, and then also it's due to human activity, um, such as human development and grazing practices um, that have fragmented the landscape and also reduced um, there's natural field loads and field connectivity within these areas. And so the reason that fire is now a major threat uh, for these sagebrush lands is primarily due to the increasing dominance of this invasive grass fire cycle, um, especially in sort of our warmer and drier sagebrush ecosystems that are less resistant to this annual grass invasion and also less resilient after disturbance. And so these non-native fire prone grasses, they invade the sagebrush ecosystem, out competing native, and, um, and they also dry out early uh, before the fire season even begins. And these grasses kind of provide this contiguous fine fuels that just ignite easily, and they increase fire occurrence and spread. And then after fire, uh, cheatgrass rapidly recovers um, out competing natives, while native species like sagebrush just really don't recover and eventually disappear across the landscape. And, and it's resulting in these monocultures of cheatgrass. And so the end result is high rates of conversion of sagebrush to non native grassland communities that continue to spread across the landscape and promote these frequent fires. And so we're seeing this positive feedback loop. And so Bromus pectorum, also known as cheatgrass, is an invasive annual grass that was brought over in the early 1900s in Asia, from Asia, sorry. And over the past few decades, uh, warmer temperatures and weather patterns have been really conducive um, to a substantial increase of Bromus pectorum across the Western US. Um, and so the figure on the left uh, was developed by Jones et al. in 2019 from the uh, University of Montana. And it depicts how the distribution and cover of annual invasive grasses just have increased between the years of 1990 and 2018. And so the spread and interaction of invasives with fire has really created these large expanses of monocultures of cheatgrass. And cheatgrass is now expanding into higher elevations and further east. So we're seeing it, for example, in Wyoming. Um, it's in Yellowstone National Park. And if it continues unabated, then it will likely change these fire regimes in these areas as well. And the figure on the right right here, um, it represents the change in the proportion of shrubland and grasslands just over the past 100 years. Um, so the picture on the top was taken in 1901, and it's really representative of what you see in these old Western movies. Um, while the picture in the middle was taken in the same spot in 2008. And so this is just a great example of the ecotype conversion to invasive grasses that are occurring across the Great Basin. Um, the graph at the bottom shows the proportion of shrubland versus the proportion of grassland over the past 12,000 years and how much that proportion has changed since European settlement. And there are other non-native grasses that are also altering fire regimes and native plant communities. And again, you know, example is sort of our, our Sonoran deserts or, or their desert ecosystems. Um, these non-native grasses were mainly introduced for grazing purposes back in the early to mid 1900s. And these grasses continue to expand across the West in alter fire cycles in our native forested shrubland, grassland, and desert ecosystems. And this is resulting in increased fire cycles uh, where native plants and grasses can't recover and are then just outcompeted by these invasive grasses. And so a lot of these grasses include African wiregrass, bentonata, 
um, which is actually moving into our forested um, lands, you know, such as ponderosa pine. And then juice ahead, red brome, buffalo grass, and also South African lemon love grass. And so the graphics that are shown here in this slide are, are really used just to illustrate um, here that the Great Basin is the largest area with the highest fire probability across the United States. And so this burn probability in the back was developed by Schwartz et al. in 2016. Um, he's after a Forest Service research station. And uh, the Forest Service uses this um, map to predict large fire probability across the um, for the United States. And in this figure, um, high fire probability is shown in brown, whereas the yellow represents more of that moderate fire probability, and those greener areas are really kind of the lower um, fire probability. And these, I just wanted to say that, you know, in, um, with this one figure, that these high fire probabilities in the Great Basin really correlate well with the occurrence of these invasive annual grasses. And um, so this map on the left is a depiction of altered fire regimes and, and departure. Um, it was developed by McHugh and Finney in uh, 2019. It's a preliminary analysis. Um, and it was produced by just very simply calculating the ratio between that large fire probability map that I just showed in the last slide and the historic mean fire return interval for each vegetation type across the US. And these results just help to depict areas um, that are shown in yellow to red, um, where we are currently experiencing too much fire for these ecosystems. Whereas areas that are shown in the green to blue um, are areas that are experiencing a, a, a degree of a deficit of fire. And the graph on the right really just shows the vegetation types um, that I ended up analyzing that are at risk of too much fire across the United States. And it's probably a little hard to see, but um, the top five vegetation communities are the big basin, sagebrush, shoveling, and steppe, introduced annual grasses, um, desert scrub, salt desert scrub, and pinyon juniper woodlands. And, um, and all of these are mainly occurring uh, within the Great Basin. In addition, these uh, big basin sagebrush communities have the probability of experiencing a fire 57 times more than their historical mean fire return interval. And so given all these trends, you know, I was really interested in comparing acres burned on forest lands to non-forested lands. That includes sagebrush, shrublands, grasslands, and desert ecosystems. And so I conducted a time series GIS analysis um, using historic fire perimeters from 2000 to 2018 and corresponding mapped vegetation data sets across the entire lower 48. And this comes from land fire. Um, so in this graph, uh, the green bars represent the summed acres burned every year from 2000 to 2018 for our tree-dominated or forested lands. And the orange bars represent non-forested lands. And these results show that just over the past two decades, there's this new trend emerging of more acres burning in our non-forested than on our forested lands. And across all of our land ownerships uh, for the lower 48, 13 out of the past 19 years, we've had more acres burn in these non-forest types than on our forested lands. And so next, um, I compared acres burned in forests to non-forest across the Department of Interior agencies' jurisdictions. You know, and this includes BLM, the Fish and Wildlife Service, National Park Service, and also Bureau of Indian Affairs lands. And the dark orange bar here, dark orange bars here represent acres burned in our non-forested, whereas dark green represents our forested lands. And the results show that acres burned in non-forested was significantly higher than on our forested lands for the Department of Interior. And so for 73% of our area burned was actually occurring 
in more of our shrubland grassland um, ecosystems. Um, and so for the Department of Interior, we don't really have a, a, a strong forest fire world. Um, furthermore, acres that are burned in these non-forested communities are occurring primarily on BLM lands. And that's um, illustrated here in this graph with the lighter orange and the lighter green. And so the BLM acres burned in light orange are occurring on our non-forested lands. And the light green represents um, forested lands burned on BLM lands. And so 85% of Department of Interior non-forested acres burned are on BLM lands. And 40% of our Department of Interior forested acres burned are on BLM lands. And, you know, for the Forest Service, you know, wildfire and forest still dominate on Forest Service lands. You know, where 78% of their wildfires are occurring in their forest. And this makes sense, you know, um, because Forest Service boundaries were drawn around forests and BLM boundaries were largely drawn around non-forested areas. However, in just the past few decades, our wildfire trends have changed significantly, um, where our non-forested lands are now burning as much as our forested lands. And so the graph at the bottom um, is just from 2000 to 2018, and 40% of our acres burned are on federal lands are occurring in our non-forest types. Whereas the graph up on the top right corner um, is a comparison of acres burned in forests and also non-forested areas across all land ownerships. And here we see that wildfires uh, and more acres have burned in our non-forested types. And it's accounting for 56% of our, our wildfires. And so there are many impacts of um, these altered fire regimes for these non-forested ecosystems. Um, there's increased risk to human life and property, um, high fire management costs, uh, loss of cultural and economic resources. And in addition, there's also many wildlife population declines um, due to sagebrush loss and fragmentation due to wildfire. You know, and this includes pygmy rabbits, but it also includes you know, the iconic uh, greater sage grouse, um, which is a species that's been considered for listing many times um, since, you know, I think like the early 2000s, um, really due to habitat loss and fragmentation. And, and a lot of that, you know, fire and invasive cycle is a primary factor in that habitat loss. And so currently, we are seeing a number of wildland fire management challenges. And this includes, you know, like I mentioned before, this increase in the duration and the severity of our fire seasons. We are now also seeing a decrease in our firefighting workforce. Um, we do have a reduced resilience of the landscape. Uh, we're seeing an increase in development in the wildland urban interface. And we also face federal fire funding challenges. And here, um, really our federal wildland fire management funding is largely focused on forest fires. And this table below is just the comparison of our wildland fire budgets for two federal agencies, the BLM and the Forest Service. And this table is, it's not really an apples to apples comparison um, because we do have different programs, different agencies. But it does highlight that there is an imbalance in funding, and it's largely due to the Forest Service's historical role in addressing the nation's wildfire issues. And so while BLM actually manages more acreage than the Forest Service, and over the last five years has had more acreage burn, um, BLM budgets are substantially lower in comparison to the Forest Service for all programs. You know, so for example, just for fire preparedness and, and getting ready for the um, fire season, BLM receives 35 million, um, the Forest Service, oh wait, no, preparedness, sorry, BLM receives 180 million and the Forest Service receives 1.3 billion.
And we have other additional challenges as well. And so one big challenge is that we have our whole culture is just focused in on forest fires. And um, in our current legislation, um, and just are focused in on forest field reductions and they do not address what are these unique aspects of fires that are occurring in our shrubland grassland non-forested communities uh, due to this invasive annual non-native grass, um, especially for the Department of Interior. And you know, and again, examples include the Healthy Forest Restoration Act, um, the omnibus from uh, 2018, which provided additional tools to the US Forest Service for forest resiliency, and even the Farm Bill 2019, um, really promoting forest resilience and active forest management. Um, we also have challenges with the public's understanding of fire. Um, the public's understanding of fire is that past fire suppression resulted in the fires that they see today and they are not aware of other causes of uncharacteristic fires and unaware of the issues with these invasives and fire cycles. You know, so for example, if you just do a Google search, 99% um, of that search will be about forest fires. Um, in addition, we have challenges with how the media portrays fire. Um, media really emphasizes fire on forested lands and surrounding communities. And it's more of this reactive coverage of fires rather than a combination of our proactive and more um, education and, and reactive coverage, you know, kind of a combination of it all. Um, so the BLM and the forest has actually been holding these media workshops and really trying to help educate the media about wildland fire across many different ecosystem types. And um, much of our research has really been focused in on forested lands and forest fires. And so we definitely have a need to increase research and attention on uncharacteristic fire and on non-forested ecosystems. And so for the Forest Service, there is actually a specific wildfire research arm. Uh, whereas for the Department of Interior, we do have a limited fire research funding. And, um, and we have a number of research gaps and I'm and highlight two of them here. Um, but one is the effectiveness of field treatments and field breaks in reducing the extent of fire at very large scales. And also um, just large scale effective invasive reduction methods. You know, we really are lost as to what to do here. And we have challenges with human caused fires. You know, um, these human caused fires really create sort of a different pattern and distribution um, compared to our lightning caused fires. And because of that, they're harder to plan a wildfire response to sort of these many different random events occurring across the US. And our human caused fire ignitions um, range from 88 to 95% of all of our fires. And again, that's due to all these causes, you know, power lines, recreation, target shooting, campfires, vehicles. Fireworks. So there are a number of opportunities for reducing this wildfire and invasive cycle in our non-forested systems. Um, first is really uh, in integration uh, between state and federal invasive programs and wildfire management programs. Uh, we need to increase coordination for targeted prevention, control, and eradication of these invasive grasses. Uh, we need to fund research for non-forested wildfire management, you know, really being able to test strategically placed field treatments and invasive fuels reduction strategies. Um, we need to develop new management strategies that are based on ecosystem resilience to fire and resistance to invasives. And we really just need to elevate the issue of non-native invasive annual grasses in, in these wildfire cycles. And um, focus in on our post fire recovery efforts to really help create more resiliency uh, to fire and resistance to these invasions. And we need stronger collaboration between state and federal wildfire prevention programs for reducing human caused fires. So, really focus in on the education and developing these prevention programs that really help to target these areas that are prone to these different causes of human um, ignitions. 
And so I just wanted to touch here very quickly that there are now a number of collaborative efforts and tools that are being developed um, to help address this invasive wildfire cycle. Um, and it's occurring at multiple scales. And so I, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of them, um, but I just wanted to highlight that these efforts are occurring at the national level, the regional level, and also at the local level. And, you know, at the national level, um, I just want to highlight that there's a science framework um, that was completed in 2019, and it's a large-scale spatial conservation framework for conserving sagebrush and greater sage grouse. And it's really the result of the secretarial order, um, 3336, um, from Department of Interior Secretary Sally Jewell. She was very instrumental in, in getting that secretarial order through and really was interested in addressing the issues of sort of our rangeland, our non-forested um, fire issue and the loss of sagebrush and loss of greater sage grouse habitats. And in addition, there's, you know, this interagency Western Lead Action Plan. Um, the uh, Western Agencies for Fishing, what is it? Western Association for Fish and Wildlife Agencies are currently developing a safe brush conservation strategy with a large focus on uh, these altered fire regimes for these safe brush ecosystems. Uh, the Western Governors Association um, has an invasive subcommittee now that's addressing this issue. And the Department of Interior's National Invasive Species Council uh, called NISC is working with our Wildland Fire Leadership Council and also developing this interagency strategy and trying to elevate this issue up in, into our leadership of our government. And so in managing uh, for these non-native grasses uh, across all these non-forested lands, the goal here should really be to reduce the occurrence and spread of invasives and uncharacteristic fire. And so these invasion state thresholds that are shown in the table below are from Mueller et al. in 2013. And they're just helpful for determining under what invasion state the use of prevention, eradication, restoration, and containment strategies should be applied. And it's really applicable for, for all other invasive species as well. And so in the very low to mild invasion states, kind of shown on the left in level one and level two, um, management strategies should really focus on preventing these new invasions. New invasions. And this includes you know, maintaining our native communities, identifying these communities that are most at risk, making a commitment to prevention, and also really a, a heavy use of early detection and rapid response. Um, however, it, when invasion states start to transition into that more moderate to more like uh, invasive dominated states, um, here, it's really, you know, that focus in on reducing our existing invasions with eradication and control techniques. And here, it's, it's really, you know, relying on our collaboratives and our partnerships to get this done. Um, really need to identify the highest priority need across our landscape and just have a strategic place-based restoration strategy and commit. Um, to this consistent long-term efforts in reducing these invasions. And so I also wanted just to highlight that there are a few efforts underway in developing these landscape and regional scale mapping uh, to determine where different types of invasives management strategies should be applied. And in these mapping efforts, um, really the following information should be incorporated. Um, first, the figure at the top, left, um, it depicts the cost of impact in managing invasives when using uh, prevention, eradication, control, and long-term management. And here, our control of our invasives is mo the most effective um, and cost-efficient when it's done early, uh, before it becomes a problem and it transitions into more of this reactive, um, trying to get a hold of the situation and just potentially you know, losing ground. Um, in addition, um, the figures on, in red and blue below 
um, show that the landscape context of these invaded areas matter for management. So, for example, you know, control is more effective over the long term when strategies are informed by what's going on in the surrounding landscape. So the figure in blue shows that invaded areas are surrounded by low invasion, whereas the figure in red is the opposite, and it depicts low invasion areas surrounded by highly invaded areas. And here we'll have probably, you know, will be much more effective um, in the blue figure than we will be on the red figure. But this information um, combined with maps of invasive scent cover and also the threats that spread invasive. So for example, here we have large um, fire probability um, can be used to create spatial management zones um, to determine where prevention, eradication, and control um, can be applied. And so this here is an example um, from the science framework um, from 2019. Um, and it's a science framework sagebrush wildland fire risk assessment um, that was used um, to analyze sagebrush resilience to fire and resistance to invasives. And they're using this as a strategy for prioritizing wildfire management. So our areas in green to brown represent a continuum of high to low intact native sagebrush, um, fire probability, and also resilience and resistance to fire and invasives. And the greener areas are actually areas that have more of a lower fire probability. They have a higher resilience to fire and a higher resistance to these invasives. Um, and they generally tend to be more intact. While the areas that are kind of more in the yellowish, orangish, and brownish um, tend to have a moderate to lower resilience to fire and um, less resi uh, resistance to invasives. Um, and some of our intact sagebrush here is actually at a higher risk of experiencing a fire. And so these areas that are shown in the very dark brown um, are areas where are high priority management areas. And so this information here, just at a very broad scale, it helps us to distinguish between sagebrush communities that are at risk of fire and also gives us information about the capacity um, to recover from fire and also be resistant to these annual grass invasions. And this assessment can help us inform the strategic placement of our vegetation management projects that can help mitigate the collective effects of fire and also protect and restore our sagebrush ecosystems across the biome. And in addition, it helps us to determine the most appropriate types of wildfire management actions for our wildfire suppression operations, fire prevention strategies, uh, fields management, and also post-fire recovery efforts. And so this um, table here is a table from the science framework, and it really illustrates the importance of the need for integration and sort of being able to understand the trade-offs of land management um, for research ecosystems. systems. And so our invasive plant management should be integrated and prioritized within all of our land management activities, um, such as land uses, you know, which include mining and oil and gas drilling, uh, vegetation management, um, grazing, and also in the consideration of climate adaptation. And so I'm not going to read this entire table, but I just wanted to highlight it here because it does show the different invasive management strategies that could be applied uh, for all the different management topics based on these three invasion states of um, the degraded state or transition states where there's a risk of conversion and then also the ecological impact. And in addition, um, the science framework um, includes a discussion of the trade-offs that are associated with the integration of all these different management topics. And then lastly, um, this figure here is just a great example of a spatial prioritization at the regional level. And I included it because it's in Idaho. And um, but NRCS's Idaho Cheatgrass Challenge Strategies has identified three broad reasons 
for implementation of a strategic plan to tackle these non-native grasses. Um, the first is to identify and defend this intact core. And that's shown in the green and blue. Um, and the green here areas in the map and also kind of the blue in the little diagram below. And here it's really a focus on the use of early and aggressive control of these non-native grass invasions and to promote and to promote and maintain and build the resilience of this core if we can. Uh, the second is really in those transition zones shown in the yellow and orange um, where um, here it's more of a, a multifaceted effort to include large scale restoration and be able to expand these cores um, and help to halt and reverse the regional spread of these um, grass conversions. And then the third, um, which is kind of shown in more of those red, kind of orange to red areas, is perpetual management will be required here. And it'll help mitigate the most severe impacts of this peat grass fire cycle on life and property. And primary actions in these regions include asset protection, fine fuels reduction, and rehabilitation, and maintenance of our native um, species that are occurring there. And so with that, um, just in conclusion, um, wildfire management is really very broad and very complex. And it is consistently changing over time. There's always new factors that are coming in and that arise and that need to be considered in our management decisions. Um, but right now, there really is a strong need to think broader than our current paradigm of forest fire management and really be able to focus in on our invasives in our wild fire, wildland fire management strategies to help reduce fire where it is occurring uncharacteristically. And, you know, we need to be able to manage this new wildfire risk. Um, and to do this, we need to prioritize our wildfire operation and vegetation management strategies at landscape scales uh, to really be able to be effective at reducing fire in these non-forested ecosystems. And we need to consider this integration um, of invasive management and the associated trade-offs um, across all of our different management strategies. And so with that, I'll take any questions or we have a discussion. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that uh, illuminating talk. Thank you for an amazing array of graphics and really fantastic data that's informing this conversation here. We have um, uh, nine or 10 questions up in the chat box already. So I'll go ahead and let students um, uh, turn off their their mute and um, ask their questions, it, and they can do that in the order of urgency. <laughs> I know some people have to leave to sort of towards the end, so go ahead and ask up front, and um, and I am happy to synthesize them and pull some questions out if they want to ask. If, I know there was a lot of enthusiasm in, in the questions and a number of things that um, you weren't able to address yet, including Alaska and restoration and some of those things. So I'll go ahead and let the, the students offer up their questions, but thanks again for that wonderful presentation. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just had a question. My brother actually fights wildlife firefighter. Uh, he's a wildlife firefighter. And I, I worry about him because, you know, he's so young, he's only 19. And um, so do you worry about the people that have to put out the fires? Do you worry, like, do they, um, is their health at risk? Um, yes, we, we definitely worry about them. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, they, um, this year in particular, has been a really bad year. And it's, you know, there are definitely you know, potential for health impacts, um, but also a, a potential for accidents to happen. And we have a lot of um, policies in place and a lot of guidelines in place that help protect our firefighters. And, um, and we tried really hard, you know, not to put them in harm's way. You know, that's our highest priority is definitely keeping them safe. I heard that if they deploy their fire shield, a whole investigation gets launched mm -hmm. as to why they had to deploy their fire shield. Yes, definitely. That is true. Yeah, any any accident, anything that happens, we actually um, have a full 
investigation into why that accident occurred. That is so good. I'm glad. That was just my question. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Great question, Shannon. Thank you for asking that. And for some of you, I know you were in my environmental methods class in the spring and we took a tour of the National Interagency Fire Center and um, went through all of that. That uh, video of the tour is actually available on our YouTube channel for those of you that might be interested in the kind of behind the scenes tour. But we did talk with um, the smoke jumpers who jump out of planes and went through their, their facility and they talked a lot about the safety aspects um, and, and the risks involved with that. So wonderful question. All right, who else? I can go. Thanks, Alyssa. Yeah, so you briefly uh, touched on the public's understanding of fire and that the BLM created workshops to educate and put out information about wildfires. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you believe that these workshops are enough to inform the mass public or is there a need for education, earlier education surrounding wildfires, like in high school or whatnot? Yes, um, that's a great question. And I am from the opinion that we really need to be emphasizing this in earlier education programs, um, whether that be in, you know, early like elementary school, um, all the way through high school, in, in addition to college. Um, but we also just need, I think, just a bigger media effort in, in general um, and to help address, you know, these different types of, of reasons for these uncharacteristic fires and why we're experiencing them, and as well as address our human-caused fires. Um, because if we can really help to reduce those, uh, you know, I think that would um, substantially help in the situation that we are seeing today. Awesome, thank you. I have actually work over at the Foothills uh, Learning Center, and so it's outdoor education, and I've seen all age groups of kids do um, uh, classes on fire, and they all have their own grasp of it, but they understand fire safety more, so I do agree that it would put a, lot, like, a little bit more information out there on human-caused fires, especially. Yeah, you know, I'm always surprised to, I, you know, because I feel like we really are, you know, trying to get that message out. We're trying to reach a lot of different communities and we're using many different media platforms. Um, but then, you know, sometimes I'll talk to somebody at the airport and they have never received any of that information. And so trying to identify where that gap is, you know, that link where it's broken, you know, would be really helpful. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Alyssa. One of the big themes in your talk is invasive species, and there were a number of student questions that had to do with invasive species, and um, so I'll let students who had those questions to offer them up, please. Okay, I can start this off. Um, so I was wondering if you thought that the government, both at the state and federal level, were doing enough to monitor invasive species, and also um, what you think the best way private landowners and public land users can kind of monitor invasive species spread themselves. Okay, so for the first one, for the federal and state agencies in terms of their monitoring invasive species, you know, the BLM um, does have a monitoring program, but that monitoring program includes everything. So it's not just invasive species, but we can draw from that monitoring program and be able to look at invasives and the spread of invasives over time. Um, the state level, they do have um, invasive programs, um, but they, you know, and I, and I would say this for the federal and for the state, that um, there hasn't been a large emphasis on management for invasive species. Um, I think really because it's challenging, you know, it, it's really difficult to address invasive species. And, and the areas that we can have um, and be the most effective is within those areas that are not largely invaded. And, but then there's the question of what do we do with those areas that are experiencing, you know, and are currently dominated. So yeah, I think we could do more, for sure. And for the private land question, um, there actually are a whole um, set of programs that are set up for private landowners to address invasive species on, on their lands. And um, you can find that information either through NRCS, um, but actually just through the um, state invasive management programs as well. 
Jessica, you had a great follow-up question on invasive species. Um, would you like to ask it? Yeah. Thanks. Um, my question is, after wildfires, is there like a mitigation plan to help prevent invasive species from regrowing in the area? Yes, we definitely try to do that. So we have a whole post-fire recovery um, program that is set up. And uh, what we do is we go in there and initially um, it, it is focused in on like soil erosion. And then that transfers over into developing a whole seeding strategy to help restore um, that area after the fire. And to um, the sooner you can get those, um, those native plants seeded in there, it does help to reduce um, the invasive, of, you know, in that conversion to um, that invaded state. Um, however, that program doesn't really, um, it does not fund the current need that is out there. And so while we do have that program in place, um, uh, the amount of funding that we receive for that program um, it is much less and it's underfunded. Alyssa Mollis, you had a question that I think is related to this conversation about restoration of sagebrush in particular. Um, can you pick that up here? If you could speak at all on like sagebrush restoration as far as how that works with invasive species, because I know it takes like 20 plus years for sagebrush to really mature. So yeah. I'm just like wondering how that's working with invasive species and if you've seen any success or like what's working, what's not working, that kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah, I would say that what's working and what's not working is really dependent upon, and it's what I mentioned before on that um, sagebrush's ability to be resilient um, to fire and disturbance and also resistant to those invasives. And um, some sagebrush ecosystems, and due to their soil um, moisture and temperature regimes, are actually um, more resistant to these invasives. And so we definitely have um, a higher rate of success in, um, in restoration in those areas. However, there's these other areas that have definitely that lower resilience to disturbance and a much lower resistance to these invasives. And those are kind of our problem areas and our areas that are most at risk. And um, actually we have been working quite a bit with USGS and they have been um, developing sort of different seeding strategies that kind of helps mitigate, um, you know, the invasives that are coming in to those areas. And a lot of that includes a sort of a mixture of herbicide uh, as well as planting of, of native seedings. Um, I will say there is one thing in sagebrush restoration that I feel we really need more information about, and that is we don't really have an understanding of just post-fire recovery uh, transition stages over time. You know, so for example, what comes in first, and are we restoring that first, and then in the second stage, what comes in after that? Um, sort of those serial stages of development that then lead to that stage brush full-blown restoration that we see 20 years later. Um, so, you know, for instance, rabbit brush is often the first to come in, and uh, yet, you know, in the, a lot of native grasses. And um, sometimes we'll go out there and plant all sage brush, and I kind of, you know, feel like it might be a little bit too early. But, um, so. Wonderful, thank you. So there's there's a number of questions that have to do with sort of the geography of fire and its spread. So some students have asked, you know, why is it mainly the West Coast that experiences? And, and other students, um, Daniel and Riley in particular, are asking about Alaska. And oh. if the, if so if you know anything about Alaska and can bring that into the conversation, whether it's related to invasive species or I think they both, um, we're curious about climate change in that conversation. So I'll put those together and students, please correct me if there was a different angle that you'd like her to answer. Okay, so first, and I think it's from Riley, I'm gonna read your question. Do you think that the increase in fires in recent years in California and Alaska are due in part to climate change or some of the impacts of climate change? Um, 
and I, I think to me that that is it. It's definitely due to, you know, the impacts of climate change as being one of the factors that we are seeing uh, more fire in California, as well as Alaska, for sure. Um, and they're, they're kind of separate. You know, California has um, been seeing a lot of fires. Um, and a lot of that is partly because of climate change, like I mentioned before. But California also has the highest rates of human caused fires. I think it's like 98% of their fires are human caused. Um, they also have a lot of invasive grasses, and a uh, majority of their fires are um, occurring in sort of these um, more grassland, or they start there and then they go up into the forest, or vice versa. And, um, and so I think there's a mixture of factors that are going on there um, in terms of climate change, human ignitions and altered vegetation communities and the human footprint in general. Um, for Alaska, you know, Alaska is, is really interesting. Um, and I just did a uh, national fire risk assessment for BLM and I produced the first fire risk assessment for Alaska because BLM actually, um, we have a majority of the federal land and we manage a majority of the federal land in Alaska. And Alaska, we are definitely seeing the impacts of, of climate change there. Um, we are seeing um, more fire that is occurring out there in areas that really we have not seen fire in the past. Um, so yes, I would say for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Other student questions that we haven't gotten to? Christopher, you had an interesting one about the cost of restoration and Alyssa Sepeda had a neat one about um, what makes an invasive species invasive? Would either of you like to follow up on those? Sure. Um, I have just heard many different definitions of what um, is considered invasive. So mm -hmm. for, um, in your perspective, what exactly defines species as invasive in this context? And could a native species be considered invasive? Mm -hmm. And if so, would there be a different approach to that? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, so from my perspective, when I'm thinking about invasive, I, I'm really targeting those non-native invasives um, that have been introduced here that have become a big issue. Um, you know, whether that be cheatgrass, it be these non-native grasses um, that were introduced, or, you know, um, you know, there's other different funguses, tree funguses. Um, and, and things of that nature. Um, so that's what I'm talking about, these invasive non-native um, species. Uh, for you know, some native species that maybe people consider to be invasive, um, for me, I, you know, it's, it's a question of whether we have altered the conditions that have caused their expansion and their ability to outcompete sort of our, our, the other native plants in that particular area. And so I think that definitely um, there needs to be a different management strategy for those. I, I don't know that I would call them invasive. Um, I would say that they're definitely expanding, um, but they should be treated differently um, than our non-native invasive that I, I really feel we need to focus in on and target. Um, currently, our non-native invasives are causing 42% of our endangered species. So. I think juniper is the one that's come up in previous weeks as a native expanding, but not nearly as problematic um, in terms of fire. Right. Yeah. And that pinion and juniper expansion is really occurring at different levels um, across mm -hmm. the entire sagebrush garden. So in some areas, you know, it, it's right where it should be. And in other areas, I think in the Great Basin, there is some expansion happening. Um, a lot of that, in some of that expansion, actually it's been slowing down and it's stopped. And, and that really does have to do with this changing climate. Um, you know, in, in the past, we've had these wetter climate cycles that actually encourage that expansion. Um, it also in, encourages more um, shrub development too in, in, in the grasses as well. So um, part of that expansion is because of this natural process that is happening as well as in combination with some of our management actions on the ground. Um, some areas that might be fire suppression, it might be grazing, 
that have also um, caused this or resulted in this expansion too. Fantastic, thank you. So we probably have about um, seven or eight more minutes. So I'll give students another opportunity. As you know, I have 10 questions in my back pocket, so we won't run out of questions, but I wanna make sure other people have um, as much opportunity as possible. I'll ask a question. I, and I don't know if this was answered. I had to answer a phone call. Um, do you know what the average cost of restoration is per acre in terms of like money and time? You no, know, I don't offhand. I know that it, um, it's, but there's a lot of variability around that cost depending on what's needed for that particular area. Um, so, you know, for some of these areas that are kind of more resistant to these invasions or more resilient to fire, um, they cost a lot less to restore. And, and typically in those areas, you know, they can just recover fine on their own and it's just kind of monitoring them, um, making sure that invasives don't come in. Um, whereas those areas that are, have a less resistance um, to invasives and they're less resilient to disturbance, those areas are, you know, it costs a lot. And I don't have those estimates right at um, the top of my head. But I think uh, in our next presentation on wildfire, um, I will ask Jolie to provide those estimates so you can have an idea of that. And that's on Friday. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. I've got one. Um, no. oh, go ahead. You go first. Uh, uh, so in like in terms of like restoration, I know it's probably, it varies across different uh, um, landscapes. But do you guys work from like the fringes, like where the fire has stopped towards the, the middle of the fire in, in, in restoration efforts? Or do you start from like a nodal point of the center of the fire and work outwards? So uh, what we have been doing is, you know, I mean, and this is like science that advances over time. You know, a lot of these restoration um, or post-fire fire recovery efforts have uh, resulted in seedings across the entire burned area. And so they're really focusing on anywhere that they can get to and feed. And uh, a lot of times that happens with tractors, you know, per se, where they're going in and dropping in those plugs. Um, we have been promoting, um, and especially in the science framework, to really start working from those fringes out to the center, just as you say. And in addition, um, for some of our wildfire suppression tactics, to leave those unburned sagebrush patches within the fire perimeter alone. Um, it used to be they would burn those out to remove any chance of a fire starting again. And now we're advising them to leave them there. And then being able to work off, in terms of our post-fire recovery efforts, work off of those um, sagebrush unburned patches that are within the fire perimeter and kind of out to the middle. And actually the science framework um, part two does have a lot of information in on that on some different strategies for post fire recovery. I guess I have a question sort of related, but maybe pre-fire. Um, I know there's a debate with forest fire management of over-management versus under-management. Is that similar in sagebrush habitat or is that habitat just changed so much that you really can't, uh, you can't leave anywhere unmanaged? Um, I, I would say that there is probably very similar. Um, you know, just as you have your uh, forest types that uh, that used to experience much more fire and yet you have forest types that experience fire very infrequently. Um, you know, we have that as well within our, our sage brush and our, our other non-forest ecosystems too, you know, deserts, for example, they really didn't experience a lot of fire. Um, and there are areas that are still intact and then there are areas that are much more degraded. And so really the focus for us is to develop those different management strategies to address those different levels of invasion and help protect those areas that are still more intact. So I don't know, does that help answer? Yeah, no, I think it does, thank you. 
So perhaps this is our concluding question. I would like to hear a little bit on your perspective as a, a scientist informing policy. And the backdrop of your presentation was very much um, demonstrating the role of scientifically produced evidence in advocating for a particular kind of management. And that's been a theme through our class so far this, this year. But I was wondering if you could talk sort of personally at, at some of the challenges that come from that or you know, why it, it seems to be controversial and <laughs> it also, on the other hand, seems to be quite obvious. So if you could um, just give us a little bit about why you see that as such an important piece of the management puzzle. Well, first, I definitely want to say that that scientific perspective is an incredibly important part of you know, managing our public lands. And, um, and that is always an evolving process. Um, and, you know, from just this personal perspective, um, you know, some of, some of our staff don't come from a science background. And, um, and so, you know, scientists in the federal world really help to bring in that type of information. Um, and I would say, you know, depending on what's going on on the ground, you know, a lot of that information at times is definitely incorporated, but there may be pressure for some other reason where they, they just can't make that more science-based decision. Um, that, and I would say probably though, you know, across all, everybody's very interested in science. And so like in my position, you know, not only am I working with, um, you know, USGS or the Rocky Mountain Research Stations in, in developing and identifying our needs for research in the science so that we can apply the science in a land management setting. Um, you know, but I'm also trying to get that information out to the field. Um, and I would say that, you know, that is, um, has been a challenge for a lot of our staff is just being able to identify the science that they need. There's a lot of science out there trying to find the science that actually helps address their question and that they can use. Um, so right now we are really trying to figure out how best to get that science into the hands of our staff so that they can actually use it. Um, and, and so in just creating different portals, different ways of communicating that science to them. Um, another challenge I would say is a, a, con a constant turnaround of um, political leadership. You know, one administration might have a focus on one thing that they wanna drive and get accomplished and another administration has a, a completely different idea of what they wanna work on. And so, um, you know, it's also dealing with those challenges. And any time an administration changes, you know, you have to update them and, and, you know, teach them either what's going on or what are we working on right now? And then how do we, you know, change to adapt our management strategies to address their, their interests and in what they want to achieve. So I, I would say that's one of our challenges. That's super interesting. I think a lot about communicating science to the public, but communicating science between the field and, you know, the lab or the, the scientists is a really interesting and important piece of that communication as well. Thank you. Well, we'll go ahead and um, give Michelle another silent round of applause and thank her for her time. And